So we transition now to our final discussion of the day, which is focused on the individual market, uh, which of course was a large area of emphasis of the ACA, which we've talked about throughout the day. And despite its small share of the overall insurance market, it is the market with the most difficult problems to solve and where consumers are really left navigating the insurance market on their own, sometimes with great frustration and high costs. There have been intense debates about who should be eligible for subsidies, how much help should the government provide, and how generous coverage needs to be. There have also been recent debates about the most cost-effective policies to make affordable coverage available to all. The American Rescue Plan, uh, enacted into law in March, made some temporary changes to the marketplaces, but those provisions will end in two years. So the question is really what comes next, and we have a great panel to discuss possible directions. Uh, so let me introduce our four panelists. Uh, first is Derek Hamilton. Uh, Derek is a professor of economics and urban policy and founding director of the Institute for the Study of Race Stratification and Political Economy at the New School, and has crafted policy proposals such as baby bonds and a federal job guarantee and served as a member of the Economic Committee of the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force. Next is Christopher Kohler. Uh, president of Millbank Memorial Fund, an organization that improves population health by connecting leaders with the best information and experience. He served the state of Rhode Island as the country's first health insurance commissioner between 2005 and 2013, and his office was a lead agency in implementing the ACA in the state. Next up, we have Jean Lambrou, uh, commissioner of the Maine Department of Health and Human Services. In the Obama administration, she served as the director of the Office of Health Reform at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and is a deputy assistant for health policy guiding implementation of the ACA. And then lastly, uh, Steve Parente is the Minnesota Insurance Industry Chair of Health Finance in the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. He was chief economist for health policy on the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House from 2019 to 2021 and also a senior advisor to the HHS Secretary for Health Economics. Um, just a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first, um, I do want to mention that, that Derek learned last night that he has a last minute commitment on Capitol Hill that overlaps a bit with our time. So we'll have him for part of our session, uh, but not all of our session. So Derek, feel free to, to make a, a rapid exit when you need to. So with that long introduction, Let's jump into things. And Jean, I want to start with you. Uh, let's reflect on the ACA as it was first passed and implemented. Many of the goals of the ACA were to, that were articulated at the time were to increase the quality of private health insurance options and also make them more affordable for consumers regardless of health status. When you think about these goals, if you could give them a one to 10 rating, uh, what would they be and why? Thanks for having me. I do want to begin with a caveat that my work centered on the Affordable Care Act for the decade that from when it was just a twinkle in a presidential candidate's eye in 2008 through 2018 after I worked through the Obama administration. In my last two years, I have been focused on work here in the state of Maine um, and then the last year of COVID-19. So I'm not as brushed up on the research as I might otherwise be. Uh, but tapping into my former professor part of my brain, happy to talk about grading, and I will grade the Affordable Care Act performance to last year. We're in the Biden administration and things are changing, as I think this panel will discuss. So first turning to this topic of the quality of insurance. Assuming that we're grading on a curve, I would argue that we are at an, at an eight on a scale of one to 10 for the quality of insurance improvements, especially in the individual market. You know, people forget that before the Affordable Care Act, if you were trying to buy coverage in the individual market and you had a history of stomach illness, you could have a carve out for any conditions that are related to internal organs. You could be charged more because of that previous ailment, or you could be denied coverage altogether. But we also learned in implementing the Affordable Care Act that group insurance was not, uh, not as comprehensive as people might have thought. Um, we learned, for example, that there were many plans that had annual caps. I was sitting in my office at the White House one day when a unionized plan member talked about the fact that good quality employer plan had a $50,000 annual cap and they used a private charity to pay for the one individual who had a serious illness. 
there were lifetime limits. Again, we discovered this the hard way, what it meant for people in implementing it because the opposition to these changes were significant. And we also knew that there were gaps in the benefits, just missing chunks of essential benefits that were not there before. So on the quality of insurance, I would give it an eight. On affordability, it's probably a little lower grade, probably more like a six and seven. I think it is important to remember that for people buying health insurance on their own, who are not eligible for affordable coverage through their employer, not eligible for Medicaid, there was no subsidy, no tax benefit, nothing before the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act implemented a progressive tax credit that is actually more gen generous when it comes to a subsidy than the employer-sponsored insurance tax exclusion. We learned that a generous credit, especially for people below 250% of poverty, can make a difference in their purchase of coverage. And the cost-sharing reduction subsidies in the Affordable Care Act, again, especially for the lower end of the income scale, made a difference to typical people who buy in the indiv individual market, especially for those with any sort of health condition. I think if you look at the data, lots of strong evidence show that if you need health care in kind of that middle range and even at the upper range, being insured through an ACA compliant health, private health insurance benefit policy makes you better off. But there are gaps. You know, one of the gaps in the quality of insurance is complexity. You know, we still have these surprise bills. People still don't know what's in and what's out of network. And that kind of plan design um, flexibility has allowed some of those core protections that we strove for in the Affordable Care Act, like free preventive services, annual out-of-pocket cap on your cost sharing, and essential benefits are not ironclad. And on the affordability front, we knew at passage that the subsidies were thin, especially above 250% of the poverty line. In fact, President Obama, in reflecting on the Affordable Care Act in a piece in JAMA in 2016, said that. This is what we wish we had done better and urged future presidents and congresses to, con congresses to do better for him. So there are gaps that need to be filled, but again, I think in the big scheme of things, has the Affordable Care Act improved quality of insurance? Largely yes. And has it improved affordability? Yes. Steve, let me turn to you, uh, get your thoughts on, on your assessment of the ACA. What do you think the, the gaps and shortcomings are? What has worked well? Let's get you unmuted. I didn't realize it was me. Um, so I think the um, what ACA did principally was um, from the beginning was to basically expand coverage. It didn't do very much to sort of take care of cost. Um, you can argue a little bit about what happened with some of the demonstrations with PMMI, uh, but for the most part, it has achieved that goal, and it's done it um, more through Medicaid expansion probably than through the marketplace. Um, reforms that uh, Ann talked about, but it, it did actually improve the quality of the coverage that was there. Of course, with the improvement of the quality of the coverage comes a higher premium as well, and that's been and well documented. Um, the good news, I suppose, is that over the last two years, uh, the last four or five, the premium increases have stabilized a fair bit and the market is is pretty much placed. The, the, the downside, though, has been that uh, for folks that were not subsidized below about 400% of federal poverty or more likely 200% of federal poverty line, uh, really, um, you know, that it, it got much more expensive and that market pretty much, um, you know, really has diminished quite a bit. And if there's been tracking in the uninsured for the individual insurance market, it's mostly been there because of the premium uh, increases that are there. I, I know we're going to talk about the the recovery uh, provisions for COVID to address that. But in terms of just looking at where we are, I mean, it, it achieved the goal of expanding coverage, certainly. Uh, it's uneven because of Supreme Court decisions on Medicaid expansion uh, in terms of where things had to be there. Uh, probably if, uh, if the law was bipartisan in the end, maybe that would never have occurred, but that's just the state of the politics of where we are. Uh, and there's probably areas uh, for improvement um, to go forward. Derek or Chris, um, you know, any any thoughts or comments on, you know, before we jump into some of the more recent developments and future directions in terms of, you know, the, the impact of the ACA and what we like and don't like about it? And just say, 
you know, the context of this, oh, I, I think I need to unmute. No, you're good. Oh, I, okay. Um, yeah. I think the context of the question is, again, what's the counterfactual? Is it better than no legislation? I think so. Um, is it far short of where we should be? I think so as well. Uh, I think that ultimately considerations around the burden and finance of medical care at the point of delivery of care becomes cruel and unusual for certain individuals who uh, can't meet that burden and stigma of finance. We know that, um, you know, for, given a pandemic, for example, right now, where your health insurance is tied to your job, it's also a problem if uh, not only you experience job loss, but you also can't have uh, health insurance coverage. But, you know, fundamentally having health insurance ad administered not in a single payer way leaves considerations around cost and profit with the private insurer uh, intending to ration quantity, quality, and access to it in a way that I think becomes cruel and unusual. I think that, again, just to reemphasize the point, the burden and finance associated with covering medical, with, with getting medical care should be covered well before the point of delivery when you're most vulnerable, and that's the point when you're sick. Thanks, Derek. And, and Chris, you had the experience of implementation at the state level. Um, what are your thoughts? I think Professor Lambert is a tough grader. Um, maybe she's being hard on herself. But I, it all, to Derek's point, it all depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. If the problem that you're trying to solve is the individual market and uninsured individuals, I, I think it's important to remember what we were looking at before the ACA was passed. The individual market was a mess. I mean, it was, it, 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 and there you could, there was enormous variation between states. I happened to work in a state that had addressed most of the concerns that Gina talked about, but it, if I'd been a sick individual trying to buy insurance, it's all based on where I lived. And the ACA was very clear, it shouldn't be based on that. So um, I, I think by standardizing the rating rules, by expanding the pool, the ACA did an enormous service to individuals who had the misfortune of having to buy insurance on their own without the protection of employers. And it also um, expanded that market by virtue of the subsidies. Whether those subsidies took you into the individual market or to the um, uh, into Medicaid, so I, I think on that um, it was it was a significant success because it fixed the problem that it was pending, uh, trying to do. I do teach a class um, in the U.S. health system at, at um, Brown University in the public health school, and every year I send the students onto the exchange with a subsidy, and I find out what they choose, and it gives them sort of a lesson in terms of how risk averse they are. And then I make them go out and actually test that health insurance with a made up medical condition. And what I would say is that savvy 25 year olds are much better shoppers for health insurance than they are for medical services. They are babes in the woods when it comes to medical services, but they know exactly what they want for health insurance. So there's a lesson there in terms of how much complexity folks can handle and the role of whether informed purchasers, part of the dream was that informed purchasers would somehow uh, help rationalize the market. And um, I, that part hasn't been borne out. That's the cost piece. But on the quality side, good job, Gene. So let's talk about some of the recent policy changes that were part of the American Rescue Plan. Um, they're, they're time limited in terms of uh, how long they will be in place. Um, but, you know, they include removing the caps on subsidy eligibility, uh, increasing subsidies, Steve, I want to ask you, when you look at these recent policy changes, again, uh, they're short term, um, what do you think are some of the positive, negatives, uh, unintended consequences from a cost and coverage perspective? It's, well, you, you do achieve one of your objectives, which is to get more people covered by doing that. And um, by, you've also, it's not just um, looking at folks above 400%, it's also reducing the out-of-pocket percentage of income that goes as well, so it increases subsidies even below 400%. I mean, my biggest concern about it is that it's, I guess, two things. One is that if we're talking about a COVID emergency, uh, number one, um, if, it's, if you need care for COVID care, that actually was covered and still is covered uh, by HRSA. 
Um, so if the expectation is you, you need to be treated because you're uninsured because of COVID, the box was checked and about two to two and a half to three billion dollars have gone out under emergency funds uh, under that provision. So that, that concerns me uh, that there is actually not even a mention of that when this was even discussed. Um, but on the broader point, it's expensive. I mean, CBO's estimate for this is about $35 billion. My estimate is actually less than that. It's more like $24 billion over two years to do it. Um, it's pretty clear that uh, if you look at the American Families Act, that the intent was not just two years, but to extend this policy for 10 years. And the estimates I have roughly for that, and again, probably may come in below CBO's estimates, uh, are about, that's about $270 billion additional. Uh, that probably will be, you know, deficit financed. But my concern is the following to your question. It's about $250 billion additional for about a gain of maybe uh, about 2.8 million more people in the individual insurance market. That's a pretty high price to pay to get folks that otherwise could normally pay into the market under different options come into the market. Uh, I, I just think it's an inefficient use of resources in terms of federal subsidy and design for policy to move uh, in that direction. Uh, Derek, do you want to jump in on this? Um, you know, obviously you spoke about, you know, counterfactuals in terms of other approaches. And as Steve pointed out, this approach does mean a fairly large public investment of dollars for a relatively narrow gain. On the other hand, certainly the people who are getting those subsidies are, are certainly, um, you know, potentially getting more affordability in their own lives in terms of their economic well-being. Um, what is your assessment of this idea of putting more money into the exchanges and lifting these uh, eligibility caps? It's patchwork, and that's part of the reason of why the cost is so high. Um, the aspect of being able to go see a doctor if you're sick from COVID um, without fear of uh, having to be turned away because you can't afford it is, is useful and valuable. Um, but the mechanism of financing it in a patchwork way I think speaks to the counterfactual why this is problematic. Um, clearly, everybody knows where I'm going. Uh, a Medicare for all or a single payer health insurance would address uh, both the issues of, of finance and costs on the public side and also the right to health care, which is the justice aspect, which again, in, in the context of a pandemic, highlights and makes it vivid. But even when we're not in a pandemic, somebody who's sick for any type of ailment shouldn't be rationed away from getting care for that that um, for that that uh, issue that they may have. Gene, I know you you mentioned how uh, President Obama pointed out this as a shortcoming um, of the Affordable Care Act when it was passed, um, but it is expensive, um, as Steve pointed out. But but it does solve for this cliff effect that happens at 400%, where people go from potentially being uh, reasonably well subsidized to not subsidized at all. Um, you know, is this a, a good long-term strategy in in your view to completely lift the eligibility cap? So, just to go back one step to what you said, and the president did propose in the American Family Plan to make this permanent. So yes, it's a short-term gap. But it was I think envisioned as a longer-term plan, and we already have early evidence on it working. I mean, I think one of the things we've seen in the very few short months since President Biden has been in office is that the basics do work. So HHS released data this week showing that the average enrollee has seen their premiums cut by more than 40%, and the median deductible for new enrollees fell from $450 to $50. So people are getting more affordable coverage now as a result, and this is early. We've also seen that marketing work. They really did work on the special enrollment period marketing, and we've seen nearly a million more people insured since February 1, which is a lot. Coverage does matter, and I know that um, is, sounds obvious, but, you know, Steve, to your point earlier about should it just be the HRSA program for kind of people in hospitals, I can tell you being on the front lines of COVID here in Maine that it is not just hospital costs, and a HRSA program is not sufficient. There are other typical comorbidities that come with having COVID-19. Those need to be cared for. There's a so-called long COVID. People leave the hospitals and still need health care. And I do think that, that we have to, it was the right thing to do to extend coverage now to help people now because they do need it. I can tell you that with you know, our hospitalization rate still being high here in Maine. 
But going to that last question about cost, I listened a little bit to the previous discussions here today, and we should separate out a subsidy cost from price. Is it expensive? Yes. Is private insurance expensive? Yes. Is it expensive because of the administrative mechanism? Maybe. Complexity certainly adds to the cost of our healthcare system. But as the late Uva Reinhardt said, it's, the price is stupid. So, you know, have, how do we get at the underlying price of healthcare? I think that is certainly something that needs to be tackled. And I would argue as uh, the Biden administration thinks through what its next steps are, getting at this price question is a good place to go. And Chris, could I invite you into this discussion and ask you, you know, how do you view these? Obviously, we have these short-term policies in place. Would you like to see them extended long-term, or do you think alternative strategies make more sense? I'll, I'll join forces with Derek on this one. Um, it may be patchwork, but I don't think the easiest way that we can make healthcare, I can make healthcare um, uh, cheaper for you is to make it more expensive for me. And the, the, the high cost sharing and the uh, low subsidies that people were experiencing in the exchange were a function of cost shifting. Essentially, we were moving costs off to them. And so I think from a matter of justice, you do have to ensure that everyone is in the pool, which was the intent of ACA. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to kick the can down the road. The piece that Gene is talking about, about prices and costs, it is where we have to go. Um, I don't think that getting one, everyone in the, into the markets is sufficient. And so we have to understand that, um, it, whether we do it for two years or do it for 10, the there has to be a plan to get at the cost um and there is a there's another cost shift that's happening right now um from public to private I mean it's not necessarily a cost shift but the public the, the people who costs are being uh in inordinately borne by the private sector um in, in the premiums that gene talked about the prices that are paid to providers we have to get at that so in the short run i don't want to have um folks exclude from the exchange as a casualty of that but we got to get serious. This is just, this is, this is easy stuff compared to what Gene's talking about. Thanks. Um, so Derek, I know we're, we're at risk of, of losing you uh, soon. Um, so before we do, I do want to get your take on how you think the pandemic has changed the way we think about these problems, the urgency of these problems. Uh, we started the day today with a conversation with uh, between Zeke Emanuel and Tom Daschle, just trying to make sense of where we are as a country right now, politically, as well as from a public policy making standpoint. Um, what is your assessment of the urgency of solving these problems and, and the appetite for major change? Yeah, so the pandemic prevent, presents some potential silver linings. <laughs> Um, our collective public health needs are, are highlighted. Um, the inequities of our structure and system are highlighted. And um, we can look at the vulnerabilities to mortality associated with the pandemic, for example. And then also our capacities as government to address the pandemic is also highlighted. Uh, the notion of, of scarcity and can we afford to do things. Um, I think it's been demonstrated that with the urgency of both economic and public health risks, that the government has vast capacities to uh, mitigate some of those challenges and to do it in a universal way. Um, and then I'll say one other point, which is we've talked a lot about the financing associated with the market. And, you know, I, I tried to highlight how private insurers might be incentivized by both cost and profit reasons to ration some of the things that are critical as it relates to health and health health care. But the other aspect that does not get as highlighted is the stigma associated with going to a doctor either as an uninsured individual or as a subsidized individual. We're, we're naive to not think that the ways in which we provide health care is not based on our knowledge of the recipient of that health care and having a universal system remove some of that stigma of who can and can't afford. And, and I think I wouldn't want us to lose sight of that when we talk about cost and finance as well. Great, thank you. And, um, you know, Gene, you were 
you know, obviously in the in the thick of it all during passage of the Affordable Care Act. And, um, you know, do you think that the country, the, the political climate, the policy climate, the appetite for change is different now than it was then? And if so, does it change the prospects for policy change? It's a great question. And Derek, I appreciate what you just said about, like, there are moments in history that may make bigger change more possible than other moments. We may be in one of those moments, but that may be a moment for simpler reforms than healthcare reform. When you look at that child tax credit, for example, which is extraordinary, like that might be, that might be a policy whose moment has come, more basic income equality and fairness, maybe more civil rights. Rights um, are a simple, straightforward, bold set of changes that, uh, that could potentially be enacted in this moment. Healthcare is amongst the most complicated set of policies, though, because it's just like in the patchwork that we talked about makes it difficult. And I do think that we often approach the health policy debate with competing and differing goals, even amongst people who are advocates for public plans. To give an example of that, some people might argue for what we were just talking about, the rights, a simple set of you as a person in America have a right to a set of basic health services, irrespective of your background, whether you sign up, et cetera. That's one goal of people who are proponents of public plans. Another one is a single payer, meaning let's pool our collective dollars, let's use that pool of dollars to negotiate for the best possible health system with that kind of, again, I'm going to use the word rationing, not because you need to, but that's taking rationing and making it a rationale, making a deliberate deliberative system of using the finances to pay for care. But that can be done through private private insurers. I mean, Medicare Advantage is a publicly financed private insurance administered system. So again, is that the goal? Or a third one, is it about universal or single set of prices? Going back to this issue of, is the price stupid? You, you can imagine the Medicare rate system being a requirement. We have some all payer rate systems, you know, states in the nation where you're saying, okay, here's the prices, here's the ceiling, that's it. You can get lower than that, but you can't get higher than that. And again, have private actors living within a public rate setting system. I think we, we don't have a lot of consensus on which of those three examples of goals within the public plan or single payer system that people are trying to achieve. I think until we get more consensus, it's gonna be hard to chart a path forward. Thanks, Jean. Uh, I think that's a good segue to um, getting into a greater discussion on the public option. Um, and Derek, I know I think you had like a 115. So again, if you have to hop off at any point, it's A-OK. -okay. <laughs> um, thank, thank you very much. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit more about the public option. Obviously, it's a it's an idea that's been around since the original passage of the ACA. It's become um, almost symbolic in the fight amongst progressives, I think, around modifications to the ACA. Chris, I'm going to ask you, can you, well, first of all, like just for the audience, answer the, try to answer the basic question, what is a public option? I think it's not necessarily straightforward to answer because I think it means different things to different people. Um, but could you talk a little bit more about uh, how the public option has been conceptualized? Sure. I'll, um, I think both Steve and Jean are, uh, have at least as much of the history as I do. But to you, as you noted, David, the public option has been around for a while. It was um, part of um, uh, ACA deliberations until Senator Lieberman from Connecticut decided that it wasn't. And it lives on. Um, it's almost become kind of a, a solution in search of a problem. So our... our um, at the Millbank Memorial Fund, we work primarily with state policymakers. So, I, if 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 you don't mind, Dave, I'm going to narrow the question a little bit and speak speak to that. There is one state that has passed a version of a public option and implemented it. That is Washington. They have used their goal, and I think this is a really important question that we ask states and we get varying answers. What is the problem that you are trying to solve? And the problem that Washington was trying to solve with a public option was a um, a lower priced option based on public prices available on the exchange for individual enrollees that um, 
would reduce um, the creep, the cost sharing creep, the increased cost sharing. So the thought is that you, if you got a lower premium, you don't have to pay as much cost sharing. And they at least wanted to have that option on there. They have worked really hard, first in legislation and then in, um, uh, uh, in implementation to put that product on there. They had to negotiate with providers, with health plans, and it's been a bit underwhelming. Um, now, if you look at the next generation of private options, I mean, excuse me, of public options that are being discussed right now, the, every state is trying to solve a different problem. So Connecticut, the legislation is actually, they are trying to solve the problem of uh, uh, Taft-Hartley plans and nonprofits having access to public pricing advantages. So they're actually trying, they're calling it a public option, but they're trying to get those targets into a publicly a, a plan administered by the public employees plan, not even based on Medicare pricing or Medicaid pricing or anything like that. The bill that's underway in, in Colorado ends up being a real mishmash where they end up, they, they backed away from provider, from, from public pricing. So they wanna offer it on the exchange and I think to small groups as well, but they've ended up, they're completely um, uh, backing away from fixing the provider price because that was the idea was to take advantage of public pricing and use it, um, uh, set cost growth targets and price reduction targets and leave it to the plans and the providers to figure out how to do it. So it is a, it's a, it's a very loosely used term, sort of like the way we use managed care, HMOs. It's very much in, it's become very much in the eyes of the beholder, at least at the state level as they do their work. And maybe, Steve can speak to how it's conceived at the federal level now, but it's it's it um, that's the perspective in the states. Steve, do you want to jump in on that? Sure. I mean, on the federal level, and I think Jean Ann probably could talk about this obviously pretty well too. I mean, as conceived, I think that the, the notion was that this would always be a plan that would be inserted essentially in the individual marketplace um, that would be available to folks. I guess one of the big questions was what other parameters are, are put on it in terms of its regulatory structure. And in other words, does the, will the premium be regulated to a certain point? Uh, is the provider panel going to be regulated to a certain point? Uh, what? And also another thing is technically, and this it comes up against with Senator Sanders, uh, is it allowed to be a for-profit health insurer uh, or does it have to be a non-profit uh, health insurer? And then, I mean, and then uh, different incarnations, it could be simply the case of saying, just have Medicare be offered as an option, Medicare fee for service as an option federally, because we know it already exists in that space, just make that available to, to begin with. So there's, there's all different variations of what this thing could do. And then obviously, if, you know, from my, when I look at it as an economist or when I think about it actuarially, all the, there are lots of components that come into play uh, in terms of what the pricing of that would, I mean, including something Jean Ann talked about, which I totally agree with, Uwe Reinhardt's point about it's the price is stupid. I mean, if you have a price schedule or roster that goes along with the public option, that's like Medicare plus, you know, 50%, it, it could be, and you also keep the premiums artificially low, it could blow the budget. It all depends on how you actually deficit finance that in terms of what the structure is in, in different markets. It could also destabilize sort of smaller plans in different individual states because the, basically they're, but for the most part, the, the individual market still is state regulated, even though there is a federal marketplace. So there, there really are a lot of um, over how much crowd out this thing could have and the parameters that go into it. And unfortunately, I've never seen legislation specific enough to really talk about it in any serious way yet. And yeah, there's actually a question, and I'll, I'll invite others in the audience to submit questions. There's a question in here from Naomi, Steve, that seems really connected to what you were just saying is, can you make a good public option without disrupting private markets? Would we have to limit its attractiveness on purpose? Yeah, and, and if you did, then that, oh, go ahead, Dina, I'll let you do that. Yeah, well, it was partly because I think that's, that's where I was going to go, which is, we spent a lot of time in 2009 thinking about exactly this question, right? Because we were trying to, the theory of the case, what were we trying to solve at that moment in time? One set of actors then was working on this in the summer of 2009. It was a fair competition. Fair meaning not equal, but you know, trying to have same rules applied to the public plan as the private plans, you know, 
state similar benefits. There were kind of ceilings and floors on rates and premiums. It couldn't be like the second lowest silver plan because that would drive prices in a way that were problematic. It would be nationwide. We were thinking about it as a nationwide one, not as a trigger plan, not as a fallback plan because of some of the kind of consequences that come with that. Um, and I do think that, you know, then and even in subsequent years when the Congressional Budget Office used to estimate what are the impacts of that kind of model by having a quasi-regulated plan where the rates are set publicly, where the benefits are designed through democratic processes, that's the differentiation between it and a co-op, which is another type of plan created by the Affordable Care Act, and private health insurance. There was a view to which that kind of competition could create the price pressures for private insurers to get to get into more of an equilibrium that might be a competitive way to inject a public plan into a system that could hopefully meet the goals of more affordable coverage, for some people more publicly accountable and predictable coverage in the exchange. Again, didn't pass for a bunch of reasons, but just a level set. That was what we tried to design. And again, in subsequent years, Congressional Budget Office said it could achieve those goals. Hey, Jean? Yeah. I, I, I... It just occurred to me while we were talking, and maybe Steve's got it too, I might argue that we, in effect, have already implemented some public options by stealth in the exchanges, because in a number of exchanges, you have Medicaid health plans that are participating, and when they rolled into the exchange, they're no dummies. They just rolled over their Medicaid rates with the um, uh, uh, as they as they develop their commercial product. And I've watched it play out in at least one market. Well, what happens was not some enormous disruption, not a, a rationalizing of prices, but it turns out that the Medicaid health plans can offer a little more benefits for the same price. And if you shop based on price, you run to there. If you shop based on reputation or comprehensive network, then you pay up and you go to the commercial plan. So, you know, in some ways we kind of, we've done this in stealth, without the, the the big policy discussion. I mean, it hasn't it's had a, yeah. it's added some choices, but it hasn't really, it hasn't catalyzed the market one way or another. Yeah, I'll just be an anecdote before Trinity or Deceive, which is being very familiar with that because that happened under the Obama administration. It was a win-win for one managed care plan because it came in with a little bit higher than Medicaid rates, which were still lower than commercial rates. And so, like, you know, the providers were actually happy because across the, the books of business, they got a little bit more from the Medicaid managed care plan, which again was dominant. There were many more people in the state in Medicaid than in the marketplace. So it was kind of a win-win. It became a low cost private plan option in the marketplace, but it was providing its providers in that state a little bit more in the Medicaid plan. Yeah, I would I would agree actually with, with Chris. I mean, it really, it did do that. And the thing to keep in mind too is that the, Probably the, at first, the individual plans that did the best were the ones that had that Medicaid managed care experience, which was sort of, I mean, I've done research on that to see how much of those plans have grown, because I think many people know that a lot of people assume uh, wrongly that Medicaid was still run by the states and state administrators and had not really kept track in the 90s and into the early 2000s just how many of the states were like, you know what, let's just put it out for competitive bid. Uh, and, and some of those uh, organizations were multinational, as we know, whether it's Centene or Molina in terms of what they're able to do. Um, but also, I mean, if, as folks got bigger at this, they could, they literally could, from an economics perspective, you know, literally see the marginal cost of a provider, you know, because you know that's where the Medicaid rate is and essentially work back up from there. So the Jeanne's point, you can see why some of the providers be like, wait a second, <laughs> how did you know where we're depth sounding? Don't, don't. Don't hold that price to us too long. But it, what it did do was it gave some breathing room from the, for larger commercial carriers that, that made initial missteps in terms of pricing everything to kind of figure out where the right level set was, namely the blues and others, continue on in the market and expand options. Well, I, you know, I was involved in the startup of the state-based exchange in Rhode Island, which is, you know, the height of vanity that little Rhode Island can run its own state-based exchange, but we did it anyway because we got some federal money to do it. So we, 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 we dove in and, and we really tried to think of the individual, the, the exchange market as building on what we learned in Medicaid around working with Medicaid health plans as opposed to building an individual market from scratch. You know, it was, we got 
a lot more choices than we did in, in Medicaid. And we had to think about how to price a commercial product and things like that. But Steve, to your point, it was definitely built on what the state's experience had been um, uh, with developing Medicaid managed care. You know, a lot of the, the discussion, you know, with a public option gets back to the point that was made earlier about the prices. And, you know, the public option in many cases is being looked at as a vehicle to bring rate setting uh, into the market. Um, but it's not the only mechanism to bring rate setting into, into markets. So I guess that's a question if the real underlying issue is prices, and that's the motivation for trying to bring a public option into the mix. Is there, you know, will we move in the direction at some point of, of rate setting if prices are the underlying issue? So I don't have a good answer, but I'll at least start with um, obviously challenging. You know, I think anybody who looks back on the history knows the challenges of that. I would say, so here in Maine, we have a all-payer claims database. We have a HIE that we are trying to connect to it. We actually are have a first service, or we're trying to move towards a value-based Medicaid payment system that we're not letting go of. We're actually feeling like we can do better at prices than some of the um, Medicaid managed care plans that have come our way. And so we're on the brink of doing some pretty significant reforms in our Medicaid system because we actually think we might be able to do it well. We did, uh, we did pass a health reform bill last year that had as one component uh, merging the individual and small group markets because we're a small state. Uh, we have a reinsurance waiver. We would extend the reinsurance to the small group market, the first state that would do that um, in a merged market. And then we put into the proposal that we, because these are taxpayer dollars for reinsurance, would limit claims for the highest cost services where there's some competition to 200% of Medicare. So in other words, you can only submit a claim for reinsurance if that claim is at or below 200% of Medicare. We're in the process of developing what are those services, probably imaging services, for example, that have some competition and price variation. So that could be a meaningful cap and we're working our way through it. But that's sort of our, our baby step towards trying to think through how do we learn about um, rate setting when again, and, and Chris, you didn't say this, with its final point, as I'm about to say, and I can say it, having worked at the federal level and now working at the state level, states have very limited tools to be able to do any of this, given the share of the healthcare pie that they have control over. We have one uh, comment that uh, was just sent in saying, Mark Pauly would say rate setting is inevitable. <laughs> so Chris or Steve, do you think rate setting is inevitable? I, I think it's possible, um, but I think we actually have, a, if you will, a transition plan in doing this in the spirit of bipartisanship. I think your text will explode otherwise if I go other ways. Um, so the, um, at the end of the Trump administration, the, one of the things that was introduced was the price transparency rule uh, that basically is incumbent not on hospitals but on insurers, and it goes into effect of January 1, 2022, and they all insurers have to basically provide uh, a flat file of all of their negotiated rates uh, that are in place. So one of the things that's intriguing to me about this, um, and it actually relates to another rule that dropped in terms of Medicare um, reimbursement at the end of the administration too, was, and the things I learned about that, was that the Medicare reimbursement process is not, and I probably, I, I, probably Gianna will probably agree with this, it's not a perfect process. It's highly political uh, with the rugs and everything else that goes into actually building all of it, and so one way to sort of think about if we're going to have some sort of indexing pricing system or price schedule is that let's at least see what the market actually has in it first. The transparency rule is going to yield that. Right now we know what the Medicare rates are, but we also know that the Medicare rates sometimes are built on, you know, two or three decade old assumptions off a multiplier, off a procedure code that's never been really exposed to the open air of what might actually be negotiated uh, in, in, the, in the commercial space. Uh, that information is usually treated as trade secret, but that's what the rule kind of opens up and says, no, it's not trade secret. We can take a look at it. Then with that, with that analysis, then one can actually do a pretty um, more a thorough analysis to sort of think about, you know, is what Mark Pauly is saying is inevitable. That is, we sort of move to a situation where, you know, there is some more rationality. I mean, my understanding of looking at both the HCCI claims data, which is mostly commercial insurers, 
and the Medicare fee-for-service data for the better part of three decades is that there are opportunities where the, the HCC, you know, commercial pays less than Medicare. Uh, and we don't always emphasize all of that. And there's, uh, it'd be good if all of that data was seen to the light of day. There's a very, there's a very limited handful of folks that actually can see the MA data, the Medicaid data, the fee-for-service data, and the commercial data for the same CPT4 code to know how things actually level out. And I would think at the very beginning, if someone's even gonna talk about this exercise, it's not to basically embrace Medicare and say that's it, it's to actually know what providers actively have negotiated, spending literally billions of dollars in, in the commercial insurance and Medicaid specter over a period of time. So Dave, yeah. I, I would, uh, I would say the, the the great work that Steve is talking about around just opening up the black box around commercial prices is necessary but not sufficient. There is a dynamic that's going on where prices are rising faster in the commercial sector than they are in Medicaid and Medicare. That has been well documented. And so what that means is that employers are bearing a disproportionate share of um, the healthcare cost increases. The question I know it's been asked today is when when are employers going to wake up to that? And how will they wake up to that? And what will they do? Will that lead to Mark Pauly's inevitable conclusion? Um, you know, I'll point to experiments. Again, I'll, I'll go back to my state experience in Rhode Island. We didn't regulate provider rates. We regulated insurer rates. And it turns out it's easier to regulate insurer rates because there are fewer of them. There are fewer numbers to look at. And frankly, they're less politically popular than providers. So if you can put some expectations around affordability, and you can do, you we, we cap the rate of increase um, that uh, insurers give hospitals. We um, started stipulating investments in primary care and in um, value-based payments. All those are things that 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 move, um, that adapt health policy um, research, that experiment, and they don't get all the way to full-blown provider rate setting. We're also in, again, because we don't want to quite go do the full Maryland, we are working in five states to, to learn from the experience of Massachusetts around setting overall cost growth targets to avoid this cost shift game between Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial and, and individuals, the employees, and say, look, we set targets for unemployment rates. We set targets for GDP growth. Why don't we do it for healthcare? And um, we are with, with the, I'll shill a little bit, with the help of the Peterson Center on Healthcare, we're working to help five states build that capacity where I think, to, it's, it's, Steve, it becomes the perfect forum for the, 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 to discuss the differences that you're trying to bring a light to, to say, okay, this is what the data show. What are we going to do about it? You know, are we going to go after pharmacy prices? Are we going to go after provider prices? Are we going to talk about how benefit plans are developed? I think those are steps that you can do short of full loan provider rate setting. Let me just bring up um, a policy that was brought up earlier in the day. Um, so uh, Zeke Emanuel and, and uh, Senator Daschle were having a discussion about how to increase coverage and the topic of auto enrollment. Uh, came up and, and was discussed earlier. Um, you know, it's certainly when you think about the fact that the exchanges are structured in a way where many people who are eligible for relatively um, low premium plans are not currently signed up, the same would be true if we think about the Medicaid, as which was discussed earlier. Um, what do you all think of the, the idea of having auto enrollment? Um, Zeke brought up, you know, the the IRS already has a lot of income data, obviously, from people's tax filings. People could be auto-enrolled in zero or low premium plans. They could opt out. They choose to opt out, but that would make a big difference in terms of marketplace participation and coverage for the country overall. I'll make, I'll make a statement that if the IRS ever did that for Zeke, uh, I'd be uh, amazed. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Gene, New York experience with the IRS, they don't they don't play ball very easily with that type of I mean, yes, in theory, of course they could. Um, but the, I actually think uh, auto enrollment is actually not um, not a horrible idea. Uh, it, and because there is uh, recent analysis, I think by a colleague of mine, Doug Badger, who used to work in the White House years ago, uh, basically showed that you know if you actually look at all of the things that are available to American consumers, if they just took them, given their income structure. 
you could get a lot closer in terms of insurance coverage. And so, I mean, to the extent that these things are permitted in the system, but people aren't just taking them and it's an opt-out issue uh, for them if they really want to declare their independence and not take them, there, there could be value to that. And I even recall uh, some discussions with folks at the American Enterprise Institute, some, you know, right center right folks about, you know, the virtues of this. Um, I know Jim Capretta has wrote about this a few times. I know Ovik Roy has wrote about it as well. Uh, it, it certainly is something whenever I try to score something for any of those gentlemen that uh, uh, it, it does always improve the uh, values. It doesn't fix everything, but it does at least um, get you closer to getting better coverage. Well, I'll just add, I think that it feels feel like the obvious, yes, right? It does feel like an idea that would work. Um, we certainly were exploring a bunch of those ideas during the Obama administration when just time where we thought we might be able to get some legislative fixes, it would require some changes, I think, going back to kind of continuous income concepts. I mean, you know, when all of us go to, when those of us who rent go to sign a lease, we don't know what our income is going to be six months and a year from now, but you have to predict it and make a point in time choice. Some of this pure reconciliation process in the Affordable Care Act was something we didn't like at the time and would have changed. So that would be a fix you would probably want to make. You wouldn't just make it based on Current rules. There's a great paper, um, by Kristen Link Young and Sobin Lee at Brookings on exactly this topic. It's notable that Kristen Link Young, uh, was not just one of my interns a long, long time ago, but is now my successor at the White House as Biden's, uh, deputy assistant to the president for health policy. So these are ideas I hope will be coming to the forefront. Do what I would say, Steve. The the advantage of something like auto enrollment is that it creates some societal norms, societal expectations about what the default should be. The default should, be, of course, you got to have a license to drive. That what, what's the default? So you know, public health people say make the make the right option the easy option. How you create some some defaults for it? And I will say, you know, if we're going to auto enroll, I'll I'll in the absence of Derek, I'll carry his torch around saying how things should be. I I go for universal what they what the docs call universal empowerment. I think we have to facilitate a usual source of care for every person out there, a place where they go to start their health care their their health care journey, if they will. Now it's going to be different. You know, my 26 year old is going to want a different usual source of care than I will, um, in ter and 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 in terms of the needs. But we have got to change the default around healthcare is this transactional relationship that is financed by a third party that over that we have no we have no connection with. And so I I would done a lot of work with the National Academy of Medicine panel on primary care. And that's one of the things that we came up with is this notion that we need to do what we can not only to facilitate universal coverage and auto enrollment, but a usual source of care if we want to address some of the underlying cost issues that are out there. So we're, we're getting short on time, and I want to uh, ask you all a question uh, to get some closing thoughts. And, you know, as we started the discussion, we talked about how we're about 10 years post-passage of the ACA, a little past that at this point. Um, you know, again, there's some short-term policies that have been put into place, uh, you know, just two months ago at this point. What would success look like if we were to zoom forward to 2031 for the Biden administration? And if you had one key recommendation to make that outcome more likely, what would it be? And, you know, I, you know, our emphasis is really on thinking about coverage and the cost of coverage. So we'll try to, I know we can, we can travel in many different lanes in health policy discussions, but at least in terms of advancing uh, those goals. Uh, could I ask, uh, Jean, will you take a, a stab at that one first? That's a really hard question. <laughs> I, I have actually been struggling with this question. Um, so it's hard because I, I right now, I, it's hard for me because my experience in public policy is you look for what's possible and then within the realm of possibility, you figure out what's at that edge, at that shade, you know, the hazy horizon where you try to reach for because it's attainable. And it's odd to say this, but I think that what is really interesting and attainable right now is how do we take the extraordinary experience of the last year with COVID-19 where health and public health have morphed in a way probably that they haven't before, um, 
to capture that, to get more of our healthcare system kind of thinking, actually, we now understand what public health is and want to embrace it and include that more. And so it's a little bit building on what uh, Chris said about this idea of getting away from health insurance to health care and even to a continuum of health care that gets into the social factors as well as some of our public health. But it would be to me to begin to broaden the boundaries of what we're talking about when we talk about affordable coverage and making these concepts of continuous, default, regular, accessible part of that mantra. So it's, it's, if that feels like a space that would be big for our system, which is like, what are our 10 essential benefits and what is our copies and standardization, that would be a stretch for it, I think, but I think it would be an attainable stretch that would make a meaningful difference in the short run. Chris, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I'll take a shot. Um, and um, you, it's a good thing you ruled out the insurance, the, or you ruled in the insurance coverage and the costs as our domain, because I think that the shocking thing is life expectancy and our decline in life expectancy. And I would underscore the points that Jean made about some of the non-healthcare investments that we're talking about making, be that as it may. You know, if I would argue that we, thanks to the hard work of the AC, we understand the mechanics of coverage. We have to think about how to finance it. I'm really, I guess I'm really worried about this discrepancy. You know, the, the growing power of healthcare as an economic force and um, our inability to kind of get our hands around it. So we're ending up with a public and private, uh, with this public private divide with Medicaid and Medicare paying one set of rates and then and 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 the, the systems are consolidating to extract higher rents out of the private side. And so progress in 10 years means some sort of, uh, of ability to get our hands around fundamentally is the healthcare industry a source of um, a service industry, or is it a um, a, a, a revenue generator? You know, I, I've worked with politicians who complain about healthcare costs and then say that healthcare is going to be their economic engine. We have got to square that somehow. And so, progress in ten years would be the federal government facilitating that, not only for Medicare. Medicare is going to be a big enough challenge, um, uh, given the demographics but also for um, the, the, the private sector that I think is going to be increasingly rent apart by um, this consolidation trend. Steve? So uh, I know we're running short on time. I, I think, um, as I said before, I think that subsidy is too big if we're going to extend it for 10 years. But I think if you, if, and I look at it from the opportunity cost, if you use some of that money instead to create a limited, I wouldn't necessarily call it a, a reinsurance program. I would call it more of a, uh, fund dedicated for basically research for genom genomic uh, diseases or genetic diseases that essentially are multi-million dollar cures uh, that are focused initially on pediatrics. But I mean, that there's research that's been done that's somewhat bipartisan, Arena Conte, John Gruber, and others basically showing that, you know, there are great gains that can come uh, that really are cures that are possible at space that actually builds on the Cures Act uh, work. And it, it doesn't it doesn't take $250 billion over 10. It takes more like $30 billion over 10 and probably could have actually a health innovation component of what's there. I, I echo the same point as before, price transparency. I think if you do get to a point where you can have shoppable services, it'll make a big difference. Uh, high deductible health plans continue to grow, uh, mostly because they're affordable to employers in terms of offering them. About 40% of what's available is shoppable. If those prices are available, and innovators can come along and actually put together the smartphone apps of the future to let us to shop with the Trivago of healthcare. I want at least see a bet on that be made. I'm a business school professor. That's where I see things. At. That's also where the venture money is right now to see what's at. I actually think that's a pretty, if you talk about what's going on in 10 years, I think if we actually are at a point where people are more uh, able to think about shopping for their care, um, that we're in a better place. I think culturally, we have resisted the notion of having universal coverage for over 100 years. Uh, I don't really see much in the future looking at millennials and particularly the Gen Zs below with all their electronics and digitally native world and how they search to go with a one-stop all system. I think it's, 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 useful. it's a useful tonic to people to soothe their soul to say we are all welcomed in the universal coverage land. 
I would say that's fine. Have everybody have universal catastrophic coverage and we'll sort out the rest with some of the money we can save in other dimensions. And I'll also agree with Chris. I, I basically have a have a usual source of care, but also dereg the telemedicine to make sure you get to usual source of care whenever you need to on your phone and share as much information as you need. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to Derek, who was here earlier. Thanks to the three of you uh, for this terrific discussion. I know healthcare is always uh, a challenging area of policymaking. It's certainly a challenging area in politics. So uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot of hurdles ahead, I think, uh, to seeing some of these policies carried forward. Uh, but nonetheless, incredibly important. And I think some of the points that were made about how we think about the impact on overall health and well-being are, of course, uh, at the core of those discussions. So thank you again to the three of you. We really appreciate it. Um, and I am going to hand things back off to Rachel Warner to uh, wrap us up for the day. Great. Thank you, Dave. And thanks again to all the panelists for that great discussion. Uh, throughout the day today, I was struck by um, what we heard and the degree of optimism in those conversations, even in this very difficult and polarizing time that we're living in. We heard a lot about the possibilities we have in this political moment, but also that it is time for us to get beyond ideological divides that leave us at an impasse and leave low-income populations without coverage. Starting with our keynote conversation, Senator Tom Daschle and Zeke Emanuel pointed out areas where progress is possible despite ongoing divides, including in improving the infrastructure for public health, in addressing inadequate inadequacies in treating mental health and the opioid epidemic, and in supporting telehealth initiatives. Senator Daschle also reminded us that we may be in a moment of great political action that we haven't seen since the Johnson administration. The first panel made the important point that much of the debate about Medicaid expansion is about politics, not policy. The entire panel across the political spectrum agreed on the importance of avoiding all or none approaches to health insurance expansion. The panel endorsed using practical solutions to provide insurance to people who are currently being left behind in states that have not expanded Medicaid, where it is through increasing uh, whether it was through increasing subsidies in the marketplace so that coverage is free to low-income individuals, using auto-enrollment to achieve universal eligibility, or enrolling people at 100% of the federal poverty level in Medicaid and enrolling the remainder in insurance through the marketplace. This optimism continued in the conversation in the trade-offs dark tank episode about employer-sponsored health insurance. We heard, heard two very different pitches for innovative changes in the employer-based health insurance model. Despite the differences in these proposals that came from opposite ends of the political spectrum, I was struck by the relative consensus of the employers that were on the episode, who seemed willing to entertain alternatives as long as they increase affordability, give their employees choice, and simplify their own process for providing coverage. They're interested in getting beyond the divides as well and willing to test a range of innovations to move forward. The final panel, who we just heard from, really captured where we are at this moment, agreeing that the short, in the short term, the ACA did help people gain affordable coverage in the marketplace. But no one is content to rest on these laurels because we have yet to address the underlying high costs of our healthcare system. But how do we address those costs? Here we heard less consensus, particularly around the role of private insurance and government in addressing these costs. Is the public option a feasible solution at the federal or state level, or is it a solution in search of a problem? Should private insurers pay Medicare or public rates? And what would happen if providers reduced their rates to these levels? Or should we have broad budget targets, leaving it up to the plans to figure out how to live within those limits? Today's conversations have been energizing and they've also been challenging, but perhaps the pandemic's silver lining is an increased appetite for health insurance reform and for solving problems that previously seemed intractable. It is always hard to appreciate a moment of great change when you're in the middle of it, but I'm hopeful that as a nation, we can come together, go beyond ideology and work towards some feasible solutions. Please keep an eye out for um, a survey from us through the email that you can give us some feedback about the conference and also keep an eye on our website for follow up um, materials about the conference, including summaries. Uh, please keep the conversation going on Twitter using the hashtag LDI reform. I'm sorry, it's LDI HC reform 2021. 
And finally, a heartfelt thank you to all of the participants, all of the attendees that we had today. Thank you so much for joining us in this important conversation, and we hope to see you again soon.